Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of SEO Fight Club. I'm saying hello in chat as we speak and reminding people to ask questions. Um, let me... Hello, everyone. Welcome oh, to another episode of like a pro. Fight Club. <laughs> I'm having a deja vu experience, Ted. I'm having a deja reverb in the world. <laughs> yeah, yes. All right. So now that we got the uh, amateur hackery out of the way, uh, let me go ahead and bring up our sponsor. Um, if I can figure out how to do that too this morning. Sorry, I got a late start. So. So just te technical question, is it okay to boo our sponsor? Can I boo now? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter, you know, what people say about our sponsor, just so long as everybody's talking about our sponsor. So, so that's the important thing, right? All, nice press, bad, all press is good press. So boo. <laughs> <laughs> Links don't matter, boo. <laughs> yeah, links don't matter. Why do press releases matter? All right. So uh, an interesting thing happened this morning, and Lee and I were debating about it. And, and so we have a, a topic and a guest for today, and we're supposed to have Charles Taylor on the show, and he's going to uh, walk us through some enterprise field observations and what the implications of what he's seeing might be. But his boss called him into a last minute meeting. So we're not sure if he's going to make it on time uh, for the show. So we have a secondary topic and we'll hope that he arrives late so we can do the primary topic. Uh, but, you know, given given that we'll we'll talk about this other topic, which is related to our sponsor. So I. Uh, I'm recently running a press release test. And so Madge helped me out with that. He issued their lowest tier press release. We are like, you know, let's, let's use the smallest thing you got and see what we can do with it. And so that's kind of what we're doing. And uh, so that went out yesterday, if I understand correctly, and I'm still waiting for the distribution list. It takes like up to 72 hours to figure out where in the world the press release will be picked up. Then I'll get the list of all the places that picked it up. Is that right, Match? Yes, that's right. We're typically 48 to 72 hours. You'll be able to log into your account and the report should be there. So what I'm seeing initially out of the gate, brand new website, you know, just registered the domain, issued the press release the same day I set up hosting. Like that, that's what I did. And I uh, took a blind stab at the content. I didn't even run a Quora report, but I used my intuition to do something that I felt ought to break me in but I didn't look at any data on that. So we'll see if my intuition was good or bad. Um, Cause I know nothing about the keyword I'm going for either. I did no research going into it. So I think, I think I did a little too much, but I don't know cause I didn't look at the numbers. So bad Ted <laughs> good press release. Let's see what happens. This, uh, this, but, this is this is starting to feel a little signals lab. I don't know anything about the topic. I don't know anything. I, I got the thing. I powered well, it up. I'm, but that's all SEOs. Like we we all SEO pages on behalf of clients where we don't really know their business inside and out. We pretend like we do, but we don't we don't actually know all businesses. And so, yeah, we're often in a case where we're doing SEO for things we don't understand the same amount as somebody else in the space. Um, but the interesting thing was a few of the early uh, distribution uh, websites picked it up quickly. And they did this thing where they saw, oh, there's a link in the press release. So they put in an iframe of the page. And so what I initially saw one day later 
is there are these pages that don't have my content, but appear to rank for my content because of the iframe. So Google did a rendered indexing, not the simple one that only uses the source of these news syndication places. They rendered it, they rendered the iframe, they found my page's full content in the iframe, and now the syndicated news site is findable for my full content. And Lee says that this finding isn't as important as I think it is. What What are your thoughts, Lee? Well, you the way that you searched for this was you picked a sentence out of your content, threw it into Google in quotes, and it pulled up your page, and you know uh, at least one of the other pages that uh, you know was findable for that particular sentence. Um. No problem with that. No problem with, you know, it being findable that way. But the, I believe the statement that you made uh, to me was this shows that you can rank for somebody else's content. And I'm like, now you're getting a little technical in there because right. in order to rank for their content, I have to search for an exact portion of their content, which, you know, a real user is not going to do. So right. if, if you were trying to rank, wait, if you were trying to rank for, you know, snarky blue widgets, if that's your website, snarkybluewidgets.com, and you issued a press release about that, if the press release was ranking for snarky blue widgets based on iframing your page into it, that would be a finding. But an wow. exact match from, you know, the exact content, we know that's case, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it translates into ranking for a keyword. But here's here's the issue I have. Like the, the standard of proof you're asking for is beyond what the primary page is currently doing. Because we know we know it takes three weeks to play this game. Mm -hmm. So I don't rank for snarky blue widgets yet. Mm -hmm. Um so the question becomes you know, uh, well, for starters, it already outranks the original source. So for the quoted search, it ranked higher. So that by itself is like the fact that there is a path for that, despite, you know, the subtlety of the distinction you're making, mm -hmm. that is alarming. <laughs> Because it, it opens up the possibility for different types of negative SEO attacks for stealing content. So could I create a uh, mostly blank page, I frame somebody else's page as a dot on the page, and then aggressively outlink build them. And mm -hmm. so I would become the higher PR uh the higher page rank duplicate and we know in google that when you become the higher page rank of multiple duplicates you tend to be the one that appears in search and the other ones get filtered so the way it kind of works is google assumes the highest authority of the duplicate urls is the one that should appear and uh... so it's the same thing that happens with the press release. If you send in a press release, a lot of them get filtered out, and then you'll see like four or five right there. Yeah, yeah if, so it's, if, it's that mechanism. Yeah. yeah. But if Madge had issued a blank press release with only your iframe, then it opens up in it because well, it's... Cor ahead. Correct me if I'm wrong, Madge. There was no iframe in the press release you sent out. That was an artifact of the website that picked it up, right? Or did you alter what I sent out? I we put an iframe in every PR that goes out. So if you look at the bottom of the release or the link that I sent you, there's an iframe of the actual press release as an iframe. Okay, so it's not that this news site did it. Yeah, it's, it's me that did it. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. So we're, we're looking at things here. So, yeah. so Madge is... Right, this is interesting. Two, two things. One, we know Madge is a sneaky bastard, which is a good thing. The second thing is we know <laughs> from testing 
that if I iframe your content into my site, it contributes or detracts from the relevance of the page that it's iframed well, into. Yeah, you, you get a copy of the content effectively. Exactly. So, and that, you know, we know uh, that a portion of the year, uh, certain points in time, rendered indexing is offline, in which case the iframe would fail to work or fail to appear as part of that page's content during those particular times. So I know there's uses for it and I've tested and played with some fun things. You know, Madge clearly is a believer in iframes as he iframes the target page into every press release, which is a very smart well, thing to do. Well, there is a, uh, there is potentially a test we could run that would turn the whole damn industry upside down. Mm. As the fact that it's pulling in this content, it begs the question, can you iframe in your keyword density? Mm -hmm. Yes, you could. If you just had an entire page that was nothing but, you know, keywords and you iframed it into your page, yeah, it's going to count towards your your content. So and that you, starts to beg the question, can you iframe in the bulk of your SEO? Imagine all the tools you'd throw off with that gambit. Yeah, but you know the the issue with that as you know, uh, because we we had played with some ideas around using uh, you know, script injection of content onto a page is that when rendered indexing is offline, which is a significant portion of the time, you lose yeah, your yeah, SEO. Yeah. So it's a volatile solution at best. Yeah, so 20, 25% of the time, this would fail miserably and you'd have no content. And you have um, no way of guaranteeing that it wouldn't fail around, say, Black Friday. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it would be risky for any real business. But for somebody up to shenanigans, so it, it still remains viable for negative SEO shenanigans. Now, the other piece of your thing, which is interesting, is because you have a brand new site with no history, it has no power. You know, if you can iframe your site onto uh say a blank press release you know uh, onto a domain that has more authority than yours can it usurp your site outrank your site using your content that would be an interesting test hmm. so all you got to do is convince madge to let you do a blank press release <laughs> yeah, we could always apologize <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh, <laughs> well this this is quite let me run the test and then throw me off the network <laughs> uh, the the other thing i've noticed is that google has been acting like molasses on this new website so i'm i'm used to like you know taking two days to find my page in search results and uh, it's been four or five days. And so I get the feeling that Google has things in a slowed down state right now. Uh, Carolyn, is there any update on Google's behaviors? Are you seeing anything similar? Yeah, and it's mostly because they haven't done a Search Console page report since the 16th of the month. So we're looking at I mean, if we're just looking in Search Console, we're looking at molasses, basically. Now, what's, what's interesting about that, Ted, is I launched a test site last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, with, with content and stuff like that. And last Thursday, it was, you know, several pages were indexed. Um, the only difference between your approach and mine was we used the uh, indexing API um, on there. Yeah. I did not use the yeah. indexing API. I did use uh, the multi-indexer in 751. Uh, so clearly, you know, maybe Google favors the API still. Yeah, or maybe Actually, they oh, don't. Um, 
they, they favor it for the simple pass, but right now um, API is not queuing up apparently content to go through the second pass. Oh, so, so no rendering. No rendering if you use the API and if you've got any of your optimizations in there. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be great for you, <laughs> but but for simple pass, absolutely, it's fine. But Search Console manually is a hundred percent right now, and it's super fast, like twenty four hours or less. Just saying. So uh, last weekly, you mentioned that you might do a press release test based on the uh, content I'm working with. Have you given that any more thought as to what spin you might do? I have. Well, I was sitting there thinking uh, because I didn't know you were uh, launching imminently. So I didn't have a time uh, to set up something and launch uh, simultaneous uh, with yours. So now I'm considering another uh, angle of attack. And I wanted to talk to you about it uh, separately and then talk to Madge about it separately to see what would be a good thing that we could um learn something that would be useful to all of us That's so good. no no specific idea yet you could uh, uh you could rewrite my content so it's unique but equally balanced in the other measurements and then uh run as maximum press release on it since i'm running the minimum we could see what the differential is between the two what do you think madge that sounds like an idea. Shall I steal his shit and beat his ass? <laughs> <laughs> You'll definitely beat it because of the higher package. Um, but yeah, that sounds like a plan to me. All right. I and on the other note, uh, just a quick update. I now have MSN.com as well, which will only be part of the gold package going forward. So, uh, Ted, you may need to take a new screenshot soon. <laughs> Okay, yeah, just let me know when. Yeah, we'll do. Let's see. Um, but it, it seems like a terrible keyword to waste such a good press release on. You know, but it's a test. You know, yeah. it's 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 one of those things. You know, it would be, you're right, it would be more fun to have, uh, you know, a competitive term you know, like uh, DUI Lawyer Los Angeles or something like that, have two sites, you know, have one that, you know, you threw a normal press release, one a premium press release to sort yeah. of compare it. it. It might be more valuable to the end users if you did go after something harder to get. Like if you demonstrated a, a real term like that, using the top package is achievable, that knowledge is interesting. Yeah, there's multiple tests that, you know, that need to be run with. There's no shortage of press release tests. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. All right. You know, but uh, I think it's in terms of an apples to apples, you know, the only way to get apples to apples with a premium package versus a basic package is to have roughly similar content. And right now, you know, it's uniquely suited because you have a brand new site that you just launched. And uh I have spinning technology, so I, I can clone your site. <laughs> yeah, so Terry's asking, uh, so if on my new site, I iframe top competitor pages, I would ride their SEO coattails to the top. Well, we're not exactly sure how influential the content is. So far, you know, all we've shown is, as Lee has pointed out, that whatever the uh, the index yeah. is for quoted string searches, which might not be uh, the primary index, we might be going to a specialized database for quoted text that's a special system aside from normal broad match keyword search. So Lee is correct in that that quoted search is diagnostically problematic with the claim. And so uh, I want to point that out. But the fact that that works at all <laughs> is mind bending that Google would allow an indexing, a content indexing path through an iframe. 
Uh, that is remarkable. I always thought that that would be a blocked barrier. Like Google would acknowledge it as a link, but it wouldn't give your page credit for the iframed pages content. Because uh, that content is not there. So when you do that quoted search on a sentence, you're getting a search result that does not actually have that on the page. Now it's cloaked, it's technically on the page because of the iframe, but that iframe is a dot. Mm -hmm. and so technically that page doesn't have it. So it's interesting. And you know, we we'd want to know does it does that content, that rendered content, does it get processed for keyword density? Because if it gets processed for keyword density, it probably gets processed for headings. It probably gets processed for entities. It probably gets processed for schema. Can I pick up schema through an iframe? Like, yeah, I don't know. It's an yeah. easy test. Yeah. Um, can I hide, can I take all of my pages SEO and stash it into an iframe? You know, and that way when tools analyze my page, if they aren't rendering that iframe, they're I've basically done stealth SEO with an iframe if that's viable. You don't need all the complicated shit. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's a lot of possible implications to this even working at all. And so uh I, i'm surprised that google lets that work i wonder if they have a reason why they have to like is there some sort of technical edge case where a bunch of horrible things happen if they don't support it this way and so that i don't know because i don't fully understand the the rationale of the engineering but I would have thought out of the gate in terms of figuring out what content is on a page, they would say iframe content is off the page because it's very clearly like a link. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's just crazy. So we have uh, uh, Charles here. Charles, are you still able to go over your observations? Ready, willing, and able. Nice. All <laughs> right. So I will stop sharing. And let me make sure I enable it so you can share. Uh, do you want to uh, tell the audience a bit about who you are and what you do and what your experience is? Sure. Uh, my name is Charles Taylor. I am currently the Senior Director of SEO for Fox Corporation. And that includes everything you'd think it would include, Fox News, Fox Business, Fox Sports, about a couple dozen different affiliate stations across the across the, um, uh, across the the country. Before that, I worked for Verizon.com uh, for about five and a half years. And um, before that, I worked in e-commerce for a few years. And I worked at uh, LexisNexis and did small, medium-sized lawyers. So I had a chance to do a little bit of everything. Um, but last, I guess eight, nine, 10 years, I focused pretty much on enterprise. Nice. And uh, what's kind of the uh, summary of, of what you're going to be showing us today? Well, one of the things I've realized after going to a couple conference with you, conferences with you guys is I get a chance to see data that, that a lot of you folks don't get a chance to see. Like I'll see it in, at scale. Um, so I get a chance to see what does Google do um, when when they have a lot of data to process and how does Google react to things? And I've learned that sometimes Google tells the truth. Sometimes Google doesn't necessarily tell the truth. Uh, sometimes they tell their kind of version of the truth for lack of a better term. Um, and uh, that's one of the things I wanna talk about here and it's gonna be relatively simple, but it's an issue that lots of folks run into and that's uh, server errors, specifically the 500 server error. Uh, what exactly happens to your site uh, what exactly does Google do when it hits these kinds of errors on your server? Awesome. So yeah, I'll let you take it away. Cool. Now, Lee, you've seen a little bit of this. Are you excited? Oh, it, it, first off, it's very, very cool. Uh, it, and just for everybody else, you know, Charles 
uh, reached out and he said, hey, I've got really cool observation and he kind of showed and we started talking about it a little bit and I said, hey, you want to show this on Fight Club, you know, he'd love to, you know, so if you see stuff out there, if you've got data or analysis or other things like that, reach out, you know, and, and in this particular case, um, I know from talking to Charles at at least two conferences now, um, that he does have a, he's got a different peephole into the algorithm than most of us have because of the size of the organization and the number of different properties. He can look in and see things, you know, in minutes because the, you know, the crawlers are constantly there, uh, you know, across the, the range of things. So he can observe things that Carolyn's very interested in. He can observe things that, you know, we're interested in, in a very different scale and, you know, real time. So, you know, it, it's kind of fun to have certain conversations with, uh, with Charles, because sometimes he can, you know, prove or disprove something, you know, like that. So I love this particular data uh, for a variety of reasons, which will become apparent. So we've we've had obviously a bunch of updates over the past month, uh, core updates, helpful content updates. I've got another deck I'm happy to present at some point uh, for you guys to show we can, you know, with Carolyn's help, I'm, I now know what to look for. Uh, I used to not really know what to look for when looking at Google data, uh, some of the Google data in our uh, in our logs, and now I do, and it's really interesting what you can see. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Carolyn runs a uh, training uh, group for forensic SEO, where part of it, they go into log analysis and tracking down what behaviors Googlebot is having on websites. You want to mention that briefly, Carolyn? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really fun. to do something that I can share and uh, log analysis is exciting. <laughs> so I, and uh, Charles and I have had several quick conversations about it and it's just really, it's, it's really great to see it gain interest. Cause I think a, a lot of truth is down in those logs. Is there a uh, website for your forensic SEO in case people want to uh, uh, take uh, that program in the future? Yes, um, it's at uh, ForensicSEOTraining.com, and that forwards over to the page on American Way Media. And, um, and uh, I typically teach it, I think, to be honest, it's probably the, best, the most I can do is about three times a year. So um, we just finished one. So I've got to look at dates and kind of figure out the next one. But uh, yeah, all that information is on there. And of course, if anybody has questions, they can reach out to me either uh, Facebook or Skype or wherever. Yeah, you'll have to set up a wait list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good idea. Thanks. Well, you know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, I've been through uh, all of them. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is you think about something like log file analysis. You know, Carolyn goes into it and shows you how to do it. But she also talks about things that she's seeing real time. So, you know, when she when she offers the training and you go through the things, you're looking at what's different today than it was the last time or maybe even just last week, last month. Um, and so, you know, I got the benefit of seeing uh, Charles and her have those interactions and certain, you know, uh, discussions in the uh, in the training group. Uh, resulting from that because he has the ability to peek and find the obscure or the trends because he's got you know instant large data <laughs> which is you know something that's just freaking awesome now yeah. keep in mind that uh not all people have access to web logs so if you have a shopify store they don't give you access to your web logs so this type of analysis can't be done easily on a platform like that. So just note that the, the prerequisite for doing web log analysis is having access to those server web log files. All right, Charles, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, no problem. As a uh, quick spoiler alert to the, uh, the updates log data that I'll share sometime, uh, my entire first slide is dedicated to Caroline. So. <laughs> I, I I couldn't have understood any of this stuff without you, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, all right, so I'm going to call this fun with SEO field data. Uh, I call sometimes Google tells the truth. So 
uh, just a level set. Uh, there are multiple error codes that your pages can get. Um, and we've seen many of these, uh, if you, especially if you have some of those tools that show uh, show the error codes or redirects or whatnot, some of the extensions. But in general, I'm going to simplify. So there's really four types of codes. There's the 200 series, 300 series, 400 series, and 500. The 200 is basically saying everything's cool, no problems here. 300s are some type of redirection where Google or, or a user is being told, hey, don't use this, use this instead. Uh, 400 series are page or client errors. Um, and then the 500 series means there's an error on the server. So these are this is just directly from Google's uh, Google's documentation. Uh, 200 series Google considers for indexing. 300 Google says it follows up to 10 redirect hops. Although I know there's some testing that's gone into that. Um, 400 series Google when Google says, "Oh, I got a 400 page," it doesn't consider it for indexing. I would put an asterisk there and say that's one of the places where Google doesn't necessarily tell the truth. Uh, I've got. Google Search Console data showing all the 400 x all the four xx pages that Google's indexing, and and then complain to me about it. So, <laughs> thanks Google. Um, but let's focus it on the 500 the five xx errors. Uh, when Google gets these, um, they have some specific things that they will and won't do. Uh, there's three major types of xx of the 500 errors. There's the uh, 500, 502, 503. I'll be brutally honest, I'm not 100 percent sure what the difference is between the three of these. Uh, I'm sure uh, Ted, Lee, or somebody else on the call knows intimately what the three mean. It essentially, it means there's a problem with the server in some way, shape, or form. Now, what Googlebot, Google says is that the Googlebot will decrease the crawl rate for the site. Uh, the decrease in the crawl rate is proportional to the number of individual URLs that are returning a server error. Uh, and Google's indexing pipeline removes those indexed URLs that persistently return a server error, a 5xx server error. All right. So, so that's real important. Yeah. I'm going to say, Charles, the interesting thing about this, so Fox, large and you have you know the the uh the google bots are there all the time so you know if you have a server error proportionate to the number of urls they're going to find a bunch in your particular case because as an enterprise you know when you fail you fail at scale correct yeah, <laughs> yeah see this this slide right here is already triggering my ptsd <laughs> and the the reason is i i'm reading a bit ahead of, of where he's at on the talking point, that last sentence there, Google's indexing pipeline removes from the index URLs that persistently return a server error. Like this was true five years ago too. Like this, and so this information coming from Charles, this is fresh information, fresh analysis. And he's seeing that same vector of behavior now that I was fighting in online retail seven years ago, 10 years ago. And so what ends up happening on the negative SEO side, and this is it's this information that solidified for me that negative SEO was more than spammy backlinks. It, it was this behavior where Google de-indexes a page that serves a 500 error to Google by. The negative SEOs figured out if you run a slow Loris attack on a web server while Googlebot is crawling it, you can de-index your competitors with uh, surgical precision. <laughs> and so when I started lining up these feeble you know, denial of service attacks that were easy to thwart. We were like, ah, oh, we're so awesome. We're great at thwarting. Didn't realize that the damage had already been done, that they already gave the 500 errors to Google by and had de-indexed our, our pages before Black Friday. Lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue per day based on that attack that we thought was feeble and we thought we had thwarted. But we had no idea of the payload until we overlaid the feeble denial of service attack graph with the uh, organic revenue <laughs> graph from search. And when you put the those overlays together, uh, 
then you saw the catastrophe. And this whole attack, this is documented. There was an SEO Clarity uh, article, the, the Secret World of Negative SEO. So if you search for The Secret World of Negative SEO, you can read the whole accounting of it. But that entire class of negative SEO attack vector is based on this behavior, and it's been around for a decade. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over, right. but I just wanted to explain how impactful the information on this website can be. Yes, yeah, so no, just, just a yeah, fun sir. fact is the uh, on the dates and times of those historical slow Loris attacks on Ted, Charles has no alibi for those dates and times. Just <laughs> throwing that out there. Go ahead, Charles. I, I can neither confirm or deny anything at this point. Lee. <laughs> So I, I think one of the, before we jump into data, I'm going to start showing the data in a few seconds, but I think the, the key to remember is while I'm showing data that comes out of enterprise, I believe that this, that this pattern is the same, whether you are a five page site or a 500,000 page site, it's just that what's the scale you're going to see. Well, and, and a couple things did change from 10 years ago and today. So 10 years ago, uh, when you encountered this, you would be de-indexed for weeks. Um, today, when you encounter this, Google will actually retry about every four hours to see if your page has stopped throwing 500 errors. And so I'm going to be interested to see if that behavior has changed at all in your data. Uh, but there have been changes Google has made in how this functions, but yeah, my understanding is it still functions. Yeah, I, I, I unfortunately I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna show it. It still does do something uh, that could be very detrimental to most sites. Um, so, so we had a 500 error uh, occur on one of our sites um, a couple week or two ago and <clears throat> happened fast, something broke. Um, it was fixed relatively quickly, but it, the cool, cool thing was I was able to actually get snapshots in action because uh, these things can happen so fast in our sites that it, it's hard to see it and it's easy to miss it. So we had a brief server outage and it didn't even affect all of our sites. We, the, the way our CDNs work, it, it, there's a, there was a subsection of our sites and, and pages that would get hit, but we definitely got uh, we definitely had the error. So when I look at our crawl data, uh, and you can see, and this is a little polluted with non-Google data. I've realized since then that I was pulling in, uh, when I was looking for network client Google, I thought I was only getting the Google bot, but what I was actually getting is anybody who also had Google Fiber. So this is a little polluted, but you can definitely see uh, at that same time, there was a significant decrease to the crawl to our site. And again, the entire site didn't return 500. It was a section of the site returned 500. Um, I'm not sure I would consider this proportional. So their definition a little bit earlier saying we're going to, you know, slow down in proportion to the number of pages. We didn't have that many pages hit 500 errors for it to cut our rate in half. Uh, the team was able to fix the problem with about 45 minutes. It really only persisted for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so we went from we went from pretty much nothing to to a whole bunch, and we still had a couple. The downside is we always have a 500 error someplace at some time. Yeah, <laughs> you never get rid of all of it. It's terrifying because even if you ace the emergency response, you can still be so screwed. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then the, what the cool thing that I think happened is so I didn't highlight, but this area around here was where the um, where the error first occurred. You can see the slowdown for the next about twenty to thirty minutes. But notice the peak that we had. So it's almost as though Google said, oh, I know there was a problem. I know the problem has been resolved. So it's retested everything. Uh, now, for us, that all happened within about, what is that, 45 minutes or less, maybe an hour at the most, this whole process happened. My suspicion is if I had one of my just like regular uh, non-enterprise sites, maybe one of my affiliate sites or test sites, this same pattern would occur, but it would occur over a much longer period of time. It wouldn't happen in an hour. It might take days or, or like you were saying earlier, Ted, could take weeks for, it to, for this to happen. Uh, but we can see that Google saw the error. It slowed down its crawl. And then once it saw the error was no longer occurring, it tried to catch up and then it returned to normal. 
Yeah, and the the reason in the negative SEO space why this is still a viable attack vector today, even though Google can uh, scan uh, and detect resolution and put you back in the index, what they never fixed is it affects your rank position. <laughs> so some aspect of the ranking algorithm puts you in lower than where you were for a week or two. You have to earn your way back to trusted stability, I guess. And so if you if you get hit in this manner, whether it's an accident in your business or negative SEO used against you, this can de-rank your pages successfully for a number of days to a couple weeks. And so it's still a viable attack vector for e-com and Black Friday. For sure. So some of my takeaways. Um... This pattern seems consistent. Well, uh, yeah. I have a question for you, Charles. If we go back to the previous slide for just a minute. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you took a look, like if we looked at the logs going from the, the left side of the graph to the point where the problem occurred, are those all more or less unique URLs? Like, you know, does Google have certain pages that are queued up? It looks like they're queued up to come and grab at certain points in time, you know, off of your site, or is it grabbing new content off of your site? Because it looks to me like the the recovery, if you took sort of the normal level and just took the part above that and came and smoothed it back over in the valley, it's almost like it was catching up on what it missed. So I don't know if, you know, if you can look at the, uh, you know, is, are there all new URLs? Is it following a particular pattern that, you know, can confirm that that's what's going on? Because I, I agree, it looks hungry. Hang yeah, on. I want to. I want to guess. <laughs> you tell me how close or, or or far away I am from the guess. My guess is that from uh, midnight to midnight, you see a constant stream of n Google bot requests per second hitting your server, and for your server, because you have such uh, enterprise caliber resources. It's probably, uh, you know, somewhere between 20 and 200 requests a second um, from, you know, sun up to sundown nonstop. But that ends up being about 10 to 15 percent of your pages index per day is my guess. All right. We have so the, uh, this data, it's actually even worse. <laughs> Google hits everything and they hit everything multiple times a second um i have xml sitemaps that we haven't had on our site since like 2009 2010 to this day google still tries to hit them uh we've we 301 redirected them years ago i was curious about oh we have a, a we had a deficit of crawling but then we saw a, a, a jump did Google make up what it seemed to do? Because I actually kind of ran the numbers. So that jump did not make up for the trowel that we had, that, 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 little, that little burrow. What it seemed to do is it hit all the URLs one or two times that it got the 500 error on. So it hit the URL. And then it whenever it hits one of our pages, it actually hits it a couple of times. But it looks like Google just went through its entire list of everything that I had a 500 error on. It went through its list to say, is it still 500 Is it still 500 And getting yes. And then putting it, I'm assuming it's putting it into its index. It, it either did not have it in its index or had it in some queue saying, I got to check this again. Um, but as you can see, it definitely didn't check things very often. Uh, once it started, I guess once it started getting one or two that did not have the 500, it started checking everything and said, okay, I need to check everything and see if everything's working now. Maybe their server was just down. Um, yeah, but, did, yeah. but the but the total crawls, like if you look at the X crawls, we had X minus whatever. We never got, we lost crawls during that time. Um, Google did eventually hit all the URLs, but it didn't do all the crawling that it normally would do. Wow. So that means it became needy. Yes. <laughs> And, and that probably means that any new content that day probably needs special handling to get it properly indexed quickly. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Like this is just 
this is just the raw Google hitting it. So this, you know, I'm sure Carolyn's thinking, well, what about the different rendering processes? I didn't even look at that. I was just feverishly trying to capture the data before it disappeared into, a, into an ocean of an ocean of data. Because if they canceled the crawl, then page updates and new content might be missed is, is my initial thought. So we'd, we'd have to find everything published that day and then manually get indexing for it. Yeah. So my guess, and I've seen this a couple times, is that Google must have a list of URLs that have failed in some way, shape, or form. And it retries. I've well, seen this in the I've seen this in the past. Interestingly enough, Google does not slow down when it hits 400 errors. It only slows down when it hits 500 errors. 400 yeah. errors, it loves crawling 400 error pages. Yeah, um, and and I've seen Google, you know, keep uh, 400 error pages uh, indexed in search where they're findable for keywords for months. Yeah. And you click on them and they're a 404 not found. And I've seen Google uh, retest uh, 400 errors for years. And yeah. we've we've seen evidence that Google's memory can go back three or four years. And so, yeah, just simply 404-ing a page does not make it go away. Yeah, uh, definitely people, not. Yeah, <laughs> that's a bad plan to just delete pages and assume Google will clean it up. Because they'll relive that 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 mistake for a long, long, long time. So, Charles, you said you had a, a site map or site maps going back to two thousand nine that Google still tries to hit, even though you three hundred one them. When did you three hundred one them? At least a year and a half ago. So it, you know they're still trying to hit them, even though a year and a half ago you said no, nope, no, nope, find it over here. They're still going back and searching they're like hey we want that site map from 14 years ago yeah this i actually this morning just threw together a quick deck on that specific subject because <laughs> i said this is a cool thing the team will you know the folks will like to see this um but yes my i've seen that happen a lot of times where google keeps hitting things that are like ridiculously old I, oh when i first started and i would bring it up to folks like well oh, we haven't had those pages you know for 10 years 12 years and i get ridiculously old pages but every time I looked into it, what I found is that these pages at Google, these whether it's an XML sitemap, an RSS feed, an actual HTML page from the site, uh, anytime Google consistently tried to keep hitting it, when I saw in my server logs, all those pages had some kind of high quality link pointing to them. Uh, maybe, usually many, but definitely several good pages like think wikipedia think you know uh, other news organizations mm -hmm. uh pointing to those pages so um if google finds a link it follows it and it follows it forever and, and i'm i'm come to the decision um and google if you're listening you can confirm this um i think they've created a bit of a frankenstein's monster with their crawler and they can't stop it from crawling and all of these updates and helpful contents and all these filters are creating are ways for them to try to get stuff out of the index because they can't stop their crawler from crawling it just and i see it looking at my server logs like why would google crawl this file over and over and over again um it crawls it because it found the reference to it and and that's all the bot does is it just it it's it's all it's, it's what it does it's all it does mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Clint pointed out that uh, Google's uh, web spam updates largely feel like a purging of of uh, bad backlinks, and that's all they are. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence that uh, purging data is mostly what Google does anymore. Yeah, sure. Hmm. So. Uh, is there uh, more or is that yeah, the just, just some takeaways and learnings is, is, you know, the pattern seems consistent. I've seen it several times. Um, my guess would be it's going to be more stretched out for sites with less crawl budget. Uh, so if you have a smaller site, the pattern will be the same, but it may take days, if not weeks. Um, watch your server town downtime, especially during key traffic days and weeks. So Ted, this kind of goes back to, you know, Black Friday, you know, uh, whatever, Cyber Monday, whatever whatever days of the year that are important to you. What, what we would see on the negative SEO side is throughout the year, there would be two or three tests 
where they would experiment to see if they could do it on a small scale. Mm -hmm. And then they'd unleash the Kraken uh, for Black Friday. And so, you know, if you see these types of attacks that cause, you know, very minor 500 errors temporarily, uh, you know, be wary, uh, especially if you're an online retailer with a lot of competitors. Indeed. And uh, sadly, uh, the only way we could really combat this problem is with uh, big IP uh, uh, security load balancers that could thwart the slow Loris attacks in real time. And, you know, that's a half million dollar piece of hardware. Um, so big enterprises, uh, they they can pay to solve this problem, but the the smaller websites, you're you're kind of prone to Google uh, uh, acting better, and I don't know that Google cares to on this issue. And what's crazy, the slow Loris, it doesn't take much. You can just do it from like one machine. Yeah, it, it can be done from cell phones. Uh, yeah. People have demonstrated knocking out web servers with cell phones. You don't need massive distributed resources on that attack vector. Yeah, so you need a half million dollar piece of equipment. I need a used iPhone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you, you need a half million dollar appliance to stop a $25 attack. And I actually saw a demonstration at uh, DEF CON this year using a cell phone. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it, well, it's terrifying to, to online retailers. Man. I, am, I love it. Scary I, think, shit. I mean, it's bad, but I, it's cool also. <laughs> yeah, but it, it you know, if if you're an SEO and you're saying that negative SEO is spammy backlinks, you you don't know enough about the topic. You you need to learn. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. the, the scariest, most damaging stuff does not even involve backlinks for negative SEO. So uh, I'll tell you, I've seen this kind of stuff. The most I've seen this, and I, I've been in, in e commerce and both in e commerce uh, in, in enterprises. Um, and I put in here, be wary of discount services. That's, I think, most of us here, you know, we have kind of our own websites or smaller clients, but servers that are bad, I mean, Enterprise sites don't have perfect servers. We have banks of bad servers, just like everybody else does, servers that we want to get rid of. Uh, I worked at e-commerce place. We bought a company that did party supplies. Their servers were so bad that anytime we ran Screaming Frog against the site, within like, we'd crawl 10 pages, it would take their server down. So it, it, it don't, don't, <laughs> don't scrimp on, on good servers. Get a good service or hosting service. <laughs> And, and for, you know, SEOs in the audience, normally you ignore the 500 errors in Search Console because they're not part of your job. You don't do the web development. So that's out of sight, out of mind. Don't let it be. It's killing your SEO. If you're a commission SEO, you need to talk to your web developers and get those 500 errors to stop. Because if they're showing up in Search Console, they're showing 500 errors to Googlebot. That's how they got into Search Console. And so all of this stuff can be self-inflicted accidents as well as uh, purposefully executed negative SEO. It can happen either way. Sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. This is uh, awesome information. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I figured you guys would enjoy this. And like I said, yeah. I put together some more stuff. So over time, if you guys need to need, want to see some more field data. There's yeah, a... yeah. Whatever you got. <laughs> we want it all. Okay. We'll take <laughs> so, it. No questions asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just let us know when you can do it. We want to see everything you have to share. So, uh, yeah, I, I love that. Let's uh, Let's go to the... Let's go to the YouTube chat and look at some questions here. All right, so uh, question one uh, and the uh, top SEO factors web page. It says that Yake words have become a correlated factor for September. Uh, what are Yake words as the help guide on Yake word links to a web page with all HTML text. 
Well, Yake stands for yet another keyword extractor, and it's kind of a new uh, algorithm for pulling the important words and phrases off of a web page. So think of it as LSI keywords on steroids. It's kind of a mix between LSI and you know formal NLP uh, entity extraction. Um, what's cool about it is it's fast and free. <laughs> and so the, the crazy thing about Yake is it really gives SEOs a power tool to work with that can scale and be unlimited. And, you know, we can, we can eventually make it configurable as to how much it's bringing back and returning. Um, so you treat it like, entities and LSI keywords. You treat them the same way. You think of uh, Lee's famous apple pie example, and you highlight the topically relevant ones, and you ignore everything else. And I like to tell people that if you're on the fence about it, if it's not an obvious yes, then it's a definite no. And the reason being is that the off-topic stuff can hurt you as much as the on-topic stuff can help you. So this notion where you get a, a word list and you copy the whole word list and put it on your page, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. That's I'm tired of fixing that problem, so stop doing that problem. Yeah, I'll um, that. I'm also tired of fixing that damn problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not that easy. You have to use your brain. You have to think about what would come up when people talk about apple pie. And as Lee mentions, you know, it would be pie pans and crust and cinnamon and temperature and ovens and oven mitts. And, and so those things come up naturally when you discuss apple pie. And you have to think about that in the context of your keyword. And Kind of where the state of the art is on how you manually do this process, uh, people get into debates about uh, geo services. So Seattle Plumber, you're looking at your entities, do you pull in all of the Seattle entities or do you try to keep it mostly plumbing related? And I like to say, well, you want to be mostly a plumbing page. And I think Lee agrees with that. What are your thoughts on the geo entities when you look at the list? Uh, they're they're less important than people uh, give them credit for. So you know the, but uh, you know going back to your your thing, I think Yake words are you know excellent because it's free. Uh, you know it usually gives good volume, but you know there's good and bad in there. So. Like you're talking about with the apple pie, you know, the, the cinnamon, sugar, crust, bake, you know, those sort of things. But you'll also see Facebook and privacy policy. You know, those things will pop in there and they're, they're clearly not related to apple pie. So just you know, throw them out, you know, and you have to do that with any particular tool that you're using to pull entities or, you know, even your keyword research. If you go all the way back to that, there are some that make sense. There are some that don't make sense. So, you know, there's no automation that does that and does it perfectly well. Um, let's see, Derek uh, from Arneon Media asks, uh, that is uh, a push just to AP. Um, I don't understand the full context of that question. I think that's a uh, Madge related question about what he's offering. And so I think we'll have to wait till next week on that question. So uh Put a pin in that one and let's ask when Madge is still here. Um, all right. So uh, so Gary Isles was quoted in Search Engine Land is saying that expired domains don't work. H1 to H6 doesn't indicate hierarchy. Uh, and the importance of links is overestimated. So my opinion on that, uh, on all those statements, 
is that I do not believe that expired domains don't work. I know lots of SEOs who are buying up uh, expired business brands where the businesses went defunct and nothing ever came of the assets, so they reappeared onto the market. Uh, I think that's a risky game to play because it's easy to get uh, uh, sued if you get something that has value and lawyers get involved because there's transfer of ownership. The domain expiring does not give you rights to those assets necessarily. Um, so I've seen people get into trouble doing that with defunct publicly traded companies uh, specifically. Um, uh, but it, it works. Those people who play those games, it packs a powerhouse to, uh, redirect those domains to an internal page and you get all the authority from the collective, uh, backlinks of a defunct brand. So the fact that he says it doesn't work, I say, bullshit, people move the needle hard with expired domains. So I'm exact opposite end of the meter on that. Where's your proof? So that's what I'd say to, to Gary on that. Where's your proof? Um, all right, so H1 to H6 doesn't indicate hierarchy, you know, and in, in, in my experimentation, I can put the headings in a random order and they still work. So I, I'm inclined to believe that he's being honest there and that Google isn't analyzing the outline structure as much as people think Google is analyzing the outline structure. Now, there may be NLP processes that top ranking pages get exposed to that could be different than the average page processing. So there might be a path for some sort of analysis Google does on the best content it has in the system that might not be processed that happens to all pages. So is there a possibility that good hierarchy structure could help you in the end game? It, it's plausible, but I don't think you need it to get in the game and to rank for easy stuff. No, but let me let me ask you a, a different question. Do you think an H one and H six have the same power? Uh, no, I don't. Right. And in fact, and in fact, I I often think that H one might not be the most powerful one. So just with that alone, you know, even if they're not looking at you know sort of the H three's relationship to the H two immediately above it, sort of hierarchy thing there are, are clearly preferences between those zones. They don't all send the same signal. And there's lots of testing that goes with that. Yeah. Uh, and, and why do they still use them in their blogs if it doesn't matter? Because Google, if you look in their blogs, then just make the text bigger if it doesn't matter. Well, here's here's the interesting thing about the, the headings is that we have data on this going back years. So does, does a, you know, an H1 outrank an H4? And the weird thing is, because H1 through H3 are so heavily spammed, there's this anomaly that it happens from time to time in the data where H4 is the most powerful heading. And so the reason I think that H4 sometimes spikes is the most powerful heading is Google has a web spam training set and they're assigning a score to all pages to how similar does your page resemble the web spam training set. And if the web spam training set is largely spamming only H1 to H3s, when you use an H4, then boom, H4 is the differentiating uh, factor from be for being less spammy in those cases. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's a, a real system in there that is doing analysis, but I think Google might be being honest here saying they're not looking at the hierarchy of how you've ordered it in proper outline you know topic outline format 
uh, they might be doing an analysis where they're looking at spammy websites and non-spammy websites and giving you an indication. And that that probably explains why H4s become powerful from time to time when Google lets their spam training set get too old or when Google updates it, there could be a pivot event on that behavior. I want to throw this one out there because there was another interesting article uh, that, that I read, uh, I don't know whether it was yesterday or over the weekend, uh, surrounding the uh, some of the testimony made at the Google Monopoly trial. They had an ex-engineer uh, up there who talked and, you know, they had a couple of things that were revealing or one, as he said, Google does, in fact, use CTR in its ranking algorithm. And those of us that are testers went, well, duh, we know this. But one of the things that he said is that was one of the topics that Google employees are instructed specifically not to talk about publicly. And if you look, even with the Ask John Mueller and some of those other office hours type of things, the, those tend to get deflected answers. You know, they, they tend to not talk about them, talk about them by not talking about them. And it made me wonder what are the topics that google employees have a gag order on yeah the deflection list yes google and what discover is that we're hearing now is part of it yep um you know i i would uh i would still use your headings people don't you know don't misunderstand me i I think headings are vital to your SEO. Uh, what I'm not sure is vital to your SEO is the order that they appear in. Yeah, I would I would suggest that you know H1s are better than H2s, twos better than threes, threes better than four, kind of like down that. That's a, that's a fairly safe uh, assumption backed by lots of testing. And, and I would add to what Lee just said: get your H4s in there. Are you kidding me? Get your damn H4s in there. <laughs> All right. Um, and the last part of this question, the importance of links is overestimated. I think in the mind share of the SEO community, uh, yeah, people uh, think that backlinks are more important than they actually are. They're still important. Uh, but they aren't the number one factor and they haven't been for a long, long time, like for years and years and years. Like those of us in SEO testing know that backlinks work and we also know that it's not the most important thing you can typically do uh, for your website. Um, so yeah, it's it's been down on the list for years. And is that your understanding too, Lee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I... I I think that's an accurate assessment of of where links should be. But that doesn't mean they're not a big lever. They're just no, no. They're lever, they're yeah. still a mandatory part of the plan, but they're just not the number one thing on the to do list. Uh, but they're they're often the first thing I do, not because it's the strongest thing, but because they take time to put into play. And yeah. so I want to get them started early because you're basically, you need to get them cooking in Google in order to get them eventually. And we know that about three weeks is the cook time on off page so far. Uh, so we want to get that three weeks started sooner than later. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, once it's rendered it's held though it is not uh I, yeah i'm not sure on that question uh maybe i'll come back to it if you can uh, clarify for me um let's see what do you think about this helpful content update was it bad for e-commerce sites um well, in general, with an update, there will be winners and losers. So, you know, I would imagine that some e-commerce sites uh, went down and some e-commerce sites went up. Uh, typically, what we find with Google updates is Google is rebalancing coefficients of already existing factors. 
So hypothetically, they would make uh, backlinks weaker and exact match mentions stronger. And so they would adjust those coefficients. And uh, if you move sharply upwards or downwards after an update like that, it's because you were strong in one and weak in the other. And depending upon which one, you would go up or down. What we typically see when you find all your def deficits and uh, eliminate them is that you don't move up or down in these update events. You tend to just coast through without that spike in volatility upwards or downwards. So if there's a big Google update and you go sharply up or sharply down, don't feel good, you have a gap in your SEO somewhere that needs filling. Even if you went up, the reason you went up is, is you know, you have something missing and the, the coefficients went in your favor this time and it can revert. Google could undo what it did and you're going to go back down. So you have, if you go sharply up or sharply down after a Google update, there are holes in your SEO and you need to find and fix the holes. Because you should just coast through. So if Google says, well, backlinks are weaker and exact match is stronger, you should be like, good, I've got them both covered. <laughs> you coast through. That's what you want. Uh, what do you think about that, Lee? No, I think that's that's perfect. You know, it's you're if you're riding a wave, unless you cause, it's not the update, it's something that you did that caused the spike up. You know, like you went and built some links and, you know, you had a positive result from that link building. You know, if you're riding a wave that you can't explain, then, yeah, you've, you've got an exposed hole. And Google will turn, you know, those dials up and down on the different factor coefficients. So it's just a matter of time before you go back down and go, oh, Google hates my site. Well, no, they just turned a factor coefficient down. So you had a gap. You know, you wrote it up, you wrote it down. You know, no harm, no foul. Yeah, and so if if you truly went up because of an update, uh, I'd be alarmed. Just note that uh, when they turn that dial back down, you can go down too. And so whatever it is you're missing, you need to identify it and fix it. And Lee is right. Uh, there could be coincidences. Like I often thought I was hit by the first helpful content update. But I wasn't. I just had link decay on a press release. I issued a new press release. I bounced right back. The timing of it can give you the wrong impression because the update came out and my site fell, but it was actually unrelated activity. And that's very common. People always blame the update for, for stuff that isn't the update. And so you have to you have to investigate and and try to figure out is it something else. Um, let's see. Uh, my site was hit on the May twenty second update. Uh, most content ranked first page for the main keywords after the hit. Two thirds dropped outside of the top one hundred. So that's that that's getting slaughtered because uh, oftentimes what we see is you fall page two, uh, page three. Um, others stayed in the top three. Well, that's good. Um, so yeah, you know that that pattern sounds like you have deficiency in the factors that you're doing SEO for. And so you have to imagine the, the levers you haven't been pulling. And so that's it's very hard to do that. Imagine the things you've been neglecting in SEO and stop neglecting them. That's a hard thing to do. What you typically need to do is you need to get measurement data on your SEO to find out how you're different from those higher ranking competitors and eliminate those differences. And uh, Tools like uh, Cora are designed to do that. There are uh, smaller tools that do it to a lesser extent, like uh, uh, Page Optimizer Pro and Surfer. They do a few dozen factors. Uh, the latest version of Cora can measure over 100,000 possible factors. 
And so the idea is you would get a report, whether you get Cora or not, you can hire an SEO with Cora to give you the information you need. Um, so get, get the measurement data, find out how you're different and eliminate the material differences. There's also, there's one other, uh, cause Honey was over here. She had mentioned could also be a technical issue cause we've seen that you, you could have a 500 error spit off, you know, at that particular time, you know, for a few days and you, you didn't notice, but you know, your site could have, you know, tanked coincidentally with the May update. So yeah. I, I would look at technical issues as well. You can look in, you know, search console and see if there's indications that you have problems with the crawl or some other things. Um, let's see, it goes on to say from time to time, some of the keywords would pop back. All right, that makes it sound technical in nature because we see keyword cannibalization and 500 errors have that kind of behavior where the problem is intermittent. Um, so popping back is an interesting uh, symptom. Uh, but they drop back out uh, for a week or two. Yeah, that mm -hmm. could be technical in nature. That part of what you described sounds like a technical SEO issue. So I, I would also look into that. So I think Honey is correct on that. Um, let's see. Joseph says, good stuff. Thanks, Charles. I concur. That's awesome. Um, Let's see, Clint uh, is in the audience, uh, wish, wish he uh, was here. He was probably on a call or something and came late. Um, I love getting updates from Clint too. Uh, if you haven't seen his show, SEO This Week, it's on the Digital Ear YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out. Um, Clint says, Ted said not to use headings and also don't build links. <laughs> So yeah, go ahead, leave that for us. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, my question about Googlebot memory was in reference to iframe rendering. Yeah, I don't know how long Google's memory is in that regard. Uh, this is a poorly tested area as to what aspects of SEO can you leverage via an iframe. Uh, so there's a million amazing tests we could do right there on all aspects of SEO. Um, so yeah, yeah, needs more testing. Um, let's see. Uh, 29 watching thumbs up. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love a thumbs up. And, and I have an update, a channel update in that regard. Um, the monetization on SEO Fight Club was pulling in about a hundred bucks a month, and I was using that to run channel ads uh, for the channel. Uh, looks like uh, something uh, changed, and we now uh, still show uh, video ads for all of our videos, but we make five dollars a month. <laughs> so that. It, that went from awful to uh, comical. Uh, so it, it went from nothing to a slap in the face, and nothing was better than a slap in the face. So I have turned off uh, monetizations. Why Why even show ads? Why annoy our visitors uh, for that? Uh, so monetization on all videos is going off. Uh, I don't want to show ads if we're just going to get slapped in the face. So. All right, Ted, we need to talk about this. This is my retirement plan, man, and you're screwing with my livelihood here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just don't think our our channel growth is going to be meaningful on a $5 a month ad spend. Um, so it's not, it's not even worth the time to run the ad, you know? Um. So that's it's just insane, and so yeah, why bother? Was that, was that a, do we know if there was a YouTube change in you know sort of that that we were you know swept by because we were tiny or you know is that just who who knows? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that claim that if Google objects to what you have to say, you see this. There's a lot of people that claim uh, if you say certain words, this happens. 
um you know who who knows you know if 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 it ever came out as uh you know factual evidence there would probably be a ton of lawsuits so i doubt we'll ever know um but uh just know that uh you know while it was growing the channel i tolerated ads if it's not going to grow the channel screw google's ads they're gone so that's my philosophy on it um so you know there you go let me know if i should try it again someday some youtube advertising expert out there i'd love i'd love a show on that if you've got good data on that show us some best practices uh let's have you on the show for youtube advertising how to make it work and what an seo channel could expect because uh, right now it went from a hundred dollars a month to five dollars a month and man that is it was sad before <laughs> it's just funny now um all right uh let's see i think that's it uh somebody's asking has anyone used ai to create ads the problem with using ai to create ads is that it doesn't take a lot of time to do like i can usually think of an ad before i can think of a prompt that could make a decent ad like if you know if it i don't like, know what do you, you think might, on that you might be thinking differently about ads because if i wanted to do you know a 30 second video ad you know then you've got a script you've got production you've got and there are some tools that you know can allow you to do that now whether they do effective ads you know you can certainly create videos that way i think you're thinking of the uh the little uh you know, Google ads where you need a headline and basically a sentence. Yeah, I think you're right. But, you know, even still, when I get a uh, an ad that has a computer voice and it's still pretty easy, I know the technology is getting better, but it's still pretty easy to hear the computer voices. Uh, man, I'm I'm skipping those the second the button comes active. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know and if everybody has that behavior they can't wait to skip it then i i don't think it's a great route i think you need to be more clever than that the ads that get me are the are the funny ones and i know there are different marketing personas that appeal to different people but you know those uh those soap ones that are hilarious that have the you know the comical dude with a beard out in the woods doing something ridiculous to sell some soap like those things crack me up i'll watch those because they're entertaining but that's a real production that's you know that's studio commercial making um and i don't know that ai can can pull off those kinds of results yet. I haven't seen a good example of that. Um, let's see. Uh, what else you put in a site map than products, product categories on an econ site? Well, it, site maps are so slow to get stuff indexed. And so the value I see in them is is that uh, they can be diagnostic so slowly over time if you break your sitemaps up into page types so your blog posts are in one sitemap your product pages are in another sitemap your categories are in another sitemap your brand and support pages are in yet another sitemap um you know those those types of things can uh, be diagnostic as to whether or not your product pages specifically have an indexing issue. Um, but overall, they tend to not be very effective at getting all of your products indexed. And uh, uh, Kyle Roof discovered in the past that if you give a priority value of anything less than one in a sitemap, you've given Google a license to ignore those URLs. And so you got to be careful with what you specify in those because you can shoot yourself in the foot. And you can also rely on them for quick indexing. So you need to do the other stuff you would otherwise do any way to get timely indexing of the page. 
And so I wouldn't view site maps as a replacement for doing the other indexing methodologies. And as Clint Butler often says, if you need to get stuff indexed, you need to use multiple methodologies simultaneously to get your best outcome. And I think he, he is totally correct on that. Um, and, you know, Clint would uh, be able to come in here and say, Ted, you ignorant slut, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, probably tell me I'm misquoting them and saying it wrong. So we miss you, Clint. That's me saying we miss you. Hope you come back to the show soon. No, you got busy, though. Um, all right, let's see. Any thoughts on sitemaps, uh, Lee? What are your opinions of them? Actually, we should get Charles's opinion on sitemap because he's got the enterprise know-how on them. What do well, you think, Charles? Well, I would question the term enterprise know-how. I think that might be a uh, contradiction in terms. Um, <laughs> so, yes, we use sitemaps, obviously. Um, and, and coincidentally enough, the deck that I was putting together earlier today talks about how Google keeps hitting some of our old sitemaps forever, XML sitemaps forever. Um, and so uh, what I found, I don't know if I want to let this out of the bag, I guess I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit because uh, you guys have talked about it before. Um, Google likes anything that helps them to crawl and discover content faster. So whether it's XML sitemap, RSS feed, uh, one of the other many ways you can get things in the index, Google likes those things because it makes life easier. The schema makes life easier for Google and anything you can do to make life easier for Google, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, definitely increase. I am... Um, Few little tips I've learned from Google over the years is you definitely want to use your last update date. You definitely may want to make sure it's being updated properly. You want to sort your XML sitemaps properly. Um, you know, it, it's things that when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, it's kind of obvious. But how many of us really do that kind of stuff? I know we yeah. don't do it right on all of our sites. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's the. Um, and that's that's a good thing. Sorting the sitemap. I bet most people who run sitemaps don't even think about that aspect. There's a there's another one that I'll, I'll throw out there because I'd seen this in the past, but I, I was having a conversation with an SEO about this yesterday. I noticed in the past that uh, you know you have a we have primary a lot of a lot of plugins just where you have a primary sitemap and then you know it points to your pages or your posts or content by month you know and and so I would see that I was struggling to get certain pages uh, indexed and I'd notice my January pages are in there, February March April and May not but June July August and then I'd go through those you know April and May sitemaps into search console and then all that stuff got you know because google was not aware of those and i'm like how can you not be aware you crawled all the sitemaps above it all the sitemaps below it you know what happened there are just glitches like that that happen sometime and last night uh i was talking to somebody who had a site and that was the technical issue they had you know this sort of hierarchy of sitemaps and it crawled the top one and any pages that were there but these little sub maps. Google did not know of the existence of the pages in them. And when he submitted them, immediately they're crawled, they're indexed. So, you know, there's a technical uh, issues that can stem from Google not identifying and crawling those sitemaps. Yeah, and another dimension uh, for e-com is I wonder about image sitemaps and video sitemaps, because uh, if you do all of those things properly, all those channels properly, it ends up being more of page one that you can dominate with your products, more yeah. clickable things that ultimately lead to you. Um, so yeah, I would also uh, look at the other, uh, you know, content sitemaps as well. You know, it, it occurs to me that Charles has image sitemaps probably, and Charles has video sitemaps probably. Do those things help Charles? I was just going to say Google likes video sitemaps. Um, if you're going to have video on your site, there's a couple rules Google gives you. You either have to give it as the player URL or the content URL. Google wants the content URL. Um, they want the content URL because they want their little AI to crawl your video because they want to return video snippets on their search results. Um, image, image. We don't use image sitemaps. Um, a little birdie told me. If you're going to do that, put the image in your regular sitemap associated with the page. 
So you're going to have a standard sitemap for your page. And then there's the subsection under the page that lists the images that you want. Don't, don't do a separate image sitemap. You can. It's not like they're going to de-index you or something like that. But um, they want to see the associations. Google's big on associations. They want to be able to crawl everything and know what relates to what. So there you go, big nugget drop on, on sitemaps and video sitemaps. That's a good tip. All right, um, last question, and then we're going to call it. Um, do you send links to category pages or product pages? Uh, you know, my preference is the, the closer you can get to the leaf nodes for link building, uh, the better the SEO is in the long run. Uh, the tree trunk of your website typically doesn't have a problem getting links. And so it's kind of silly to do link building to, you know, the Fox homepage. Uh, there's not a lot of value in that. But a specific news story that's brand new is typically going to be a uh, backlink goose egg. It's going to have nothing. And so adding backlinks to that leaf node uh, can actually bring real value to the page. And one of the things in Ecom that I always was mindful of is how many pages on your website do absolutely zero organic traffic per month. Those are the goose eggs. And if you can find and fix your goose eggs, so all of your pages have some monthly performance, uh, that kind of does magical things to a website. So Google doesn't like it when you have an overabundance of goose eggs. And if you think about it, going from zero monthly visitors from search to one monthly visitor from search is the theoretical minimum amount of SEO you can possibly do. So doing that minimum amount of SEO on all of your pages, uh, it basically lifts all bugs. All pages become performers instead of duds. And as Lee sometimes says, there is an uncanny amount of power going from zero to one. Mm -hmm. It's a much bigger differential than going from one to four. I think, uh, you know, the question, do you build links to category pages or, you know, product pages? My answer is yes um, to that one. And I think if Clint were here, he would say links don't matter. Gary Isles confirmed it. Walk away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you find the pages with zero traffic? Uh, Typically, I, in most cases, I would use Google Analytics. You would look for specifically site entries from the uh, organic Google source medium. And so site entries. And typically, you have to game the system because Google doesn't want to give you the zeros. The Google is kind of mean in that regard. So you add uh, impressions is an extra dimension of data on the report. And so you're gonna have URLs that get impressions, but no site entries. And uh, that's gonna show you the zeros for the site entries. So you kind of trick Google Analytics into giving you this data, uh, but you have to make a custom report. You're looking for site entries from the source medium, uh, organic Google, and you are adding the dimension of page views, uh, and that will trick the zeros into showing up. All right, 